Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Muzaffar. We are now going to entertain questions and comments from uh, the audience. And there's my microphone uh, in the middle. So when you ask your question, please state your name and also uh, maybe your affiliation or if a student, then your major. Uh, use the microphone, thank you. Yeah, um, I'm sure. um, good afternoon, I'm Ara Austria under my Dietors Political Science class. I'm a second year journalism student. Um, you mentioned something about uh, Dr. Muzaffar, said something about foreign relations being affected between, for example, China and Thailand, if ever we do agree to the Secession of the Bank Samoro. In what ways will these foreign relations be affected? And how, what products would it spell for the Philippines in both economic and political platforms? Thank you. We could have two more questions before um, we ask the speaker to respond. Two more questions or comments? Thank you, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Paul. I'm from Sir Tignos Posay 11 class. Um, may I want to ask the speaker what's his thoughts about Malaysian society? Since I have Malaysian Chinese friends, and whenever they talk about Malaysia, they seem they seem to have some sort of remorse about what's happening in society even even if that in Malaysia uh, the view of society that it is a multicultural and integrated society it seems that the Chinese and the indigenous peoples there are being being ignored and being dominated by the Malay Muslims or the Bumiputra and what's, it, what's your thoughts about can there be reform so that the Chinese and the uh, indigenous peoples may be more integrated into Malaysian society. Thank you. Because we have been here. I have studied 
long time ago this problem, there are so many negotiations, and the negotiations do not amount to anything. It takes one month to go to the Supreme Court and file a petition and back to zero again, back to square. So what do you from here? If there is, this is a vicious cycle that's been going on, how much money the government is spending on our people? So if we cannot, it's like a, a, a man and a woman who are married but they're always foreign and foreign and so the best solution is to divorce. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your questions. They're all very important questions. The first question about um, why Thailand and China would uh, react in a particular way in relation to, say, this idea of a separate independent Bangsamoro. It's not something which would impact upon foreign relations, uh, the way you have formulated your question. My concern is this, that if an independent state is to function, it must gain international legitimacy, because that is one of the requirements, if you like, one of the requisites of establishing an independent state. And I do not see certain countries conferring legitimacy upon this attempt, whatever the historical compulsions may be, because it would at once raise questions about their own position. Meaning by which, in the case of Thailand, if they say, well, this is legitimate, by all means, a separate state will recognize it at once. Then people will say, what about the Malay Muslims of uh, Patani, Yala, and Narathiwai, the three provinces in the south. In fact, they may have a stronger case. This is what people would say. And Thailand would be very uneasy about it. This is the point I was trying to make. Likewise, in the case of China, with the Yuga people, Tibet. It's up to that uh, point. I'm not talking about foreign relations or breakdown in relations and all the rest of it. I think it will create a lot of uneasiness. It would even encourage some of these groups in countries like Thailand and China to strengthen their struggle for a separate independent state, which may not be in the interests of the capital, meaning by which Beijing and uh, Bangkok may not be happy about this. The second question about uh, Malaysia, if you are asking that question, uh, my friend who asked the question, in the context of self-determination, I do not think uh, the Malaysian situation is similar to what is happening in other parts of Southeast Asia. It's not similar to the situation of the Malay Muslims in Thailand or the situation of the Bangsa Moro in the Philippines. The Chinese and Indians who are part of Malaysia today, citizens, if you look at their history, their history is quite different actually. To understand their history, their role and their relationship with the Malay community, the indigenous Malay community, because it is the Malay community which provided the basis for government before Western colonialism. These were established governments that existed for a very long while in the Malay Peninsula. Hence, even the name of the land, it is the Malay Peninsula. That is its history. Now, the situation is very different. The Chinese and Indians, who are citizens in Malaysia today, are the descendants. In some instances, third, fourth generation, but descendants nonetheless of immigrants who were brought to the country by the colonial rulers at that time. In other words, the Malaysian situation would be similar to the Fijis, where, as you know, as a result of colonialism, Indians were brought from uh, India to the Fijis. The Fijis already had an established society. There were people there. They had some sort of uh, traditional 
system of kingship. In the case of uh, Malaya, in fact, the monarchical systems were far more advanced, evolved, and established without any doubt at all. They had international relations. They had relations with Holland. They had relations with Turkey, the Malay Sultanates. So these were governments that existed. And so you had the situation of the descendants of immigrants who, in most societies, you would have to integrate. You have to adjust. You have to adjust to the landscape, which has become part of your own reality. You have to learn how to speak the language. You have to learn the customs. This is what is expected of uh, people who are descendants of uh, immigrants everywhere. So I think it is that adjustment which one should talk about first. There should be that adjustment. Of course, the non-Malays or the Chinese and Indians have accepted the Malay language. They've accepted the position of Islam as the religion of the Federation. They want the constitution and they've accepted the rulers, Malay rulers, who are part of uh, the constitutional parliamentary system in Malaysia. But nonetheless, you find that there are quite a lot of Chinese and Indian Malaysians who have somehow become very uneasy about this aspect of our nationhood, when actually they should see this as something that is positive, something which they should accept, and then they should become part of that reality. Speak Malay, understand the larger society, contribute to the larger society. I think this is where problems have arisen. Now, there's a, quite a bit of resentment also amongst the Chinese and Indians because the Malay community has been given what is described in the Constitution as a special position. But here again, you have to understand why there is a special position. This special position in the Constitution for the Malay community, which expresses itself in terms of certain special opportunities in business, in scholarships, in the civil service, and in land ownership. This would not have been there if you did not have such a huge number of the immigrant population being incorporated into the Malaysian or the Malay state in 1957. In fact, if you look at the numbers that were incorporated, it was just mind-boggling. Almost 1.2 million became citizens overnight. Became citizens overnight as part of the process of accommodating them. And it changed the entire landscape of the country. At that time, the population of uh, the Malay community was only about 5 million. So 1.2 million, add on to 5 million, can you imagine its impact upon the society as a whole? And this is what one forgets, that special position was necessary because of this accommodation. Why? Because the Malay community was very, very poor, extremely poor. 70% of them lived below the poverty line at the time of independence. And these special opportunities were there as part of an affirmative action program, affirmative action program to help people who had been marginalized in history, marginalized by Malay feudalism in the past, marginalized by British colonialism. So these were opportunities that were given to them, which is why sometimes when uh, Chinese and Indians, uh, the present generation, express their unhappiness, as you put it, with things that are happening in the country, it is an expression of sentiments that don't take into account the actual realities. We have to understand the realities. And only then will we be able to get a balanced picture. The last question about uh, annexation, which uh, our friend here asked. In other words, what you're trying to say is that, like in the case of uh, the Britannic Kingdom, it was annexed. So, the solution then is to succeed, have an independent uh, nation state, which one would argue should also be the solution in the case of uh, the southern provinces of Thailand. I'm just wondering whether in both instances there are other complicating factors. How does one resolve the question of ancestral domain today, given the way in which ownership patterns have changed? They've changed quite dramatically. How does one resolve this in even delineating the area that should succeed? It has become a bit more complex. 
right? Because, as they say, a lot of water has flowed beneath the bridges. Things have become more complicated. The very fact that the Moro population is no longer the majority in Vietnam, it has been totally diluted. That itself is a change. We are not sitting in judgment of this. I'm not saying whether it is right or wrong. I think it is unfortunate that this had happened, but this is the reality today. So how does one deal with this reality? So I think it has become a little more complicated. But here again, should one have a referendum? And if you're going to have a referendum, who are those who participate in the referendum? Here, what you would have to do is to define the identity of the participants of the referendum. And this again is not straightforward. Who are the Bangsa Moro today? To a large extent, you'll be able to say, yes, these are the Bangsa Moro, but there are also many marginal elements that have to be taken into account, which complicates the situation further. So both in terms of geography and identity, it has become a bit more complicated. So what I'm saying is, uh, maybe one has to think of some other way of resolving this both in Thailand and in Malaysia. Maybe the idea of a sub-state, a sub-state, which exercises a lot of autonomy, perhaps that is a solution, but within a certain framework, perhaps, I don't know. From speaking of solutions, in the 1950s, um, I think it was the British and Malaysia. Um, there was com there were communist insurgents in Malaysia seeking to secede from the British government, correct me if I'm right. And part of how they um, diluted the impact of the communist insurgents was that they offered them idea. I think when um, this, the, the British government solution was to offer the communist insurgents rewards of security, of financial security and stuff, so that they would stop fighting them and come to terms in peace with Malaysia. So if we adopt this strategy for our current problem, uh, for our current situation, rather, how do you think this strategy will affect the case of the Philippines? Seeing as one, Britain was far from Malaysia when this happened, and here we're dealing with it at close range. Um, in your opinion, will this have a positive impact on the situation or not? Thank you. Dr. Malanas? Thank you. How are you? Hi. Thank you. I wouldn't miss uh, listening to you that nice time. Old friend from 26 years ago. Uh, and of course you know Chandra that we are still doing our surveys. Our opinion, how we will be in polling and all of that. We're doing that. And I raise my hand because uh, the very question that you asked, who is the Bank Samoa? We are doing research on that too. Uh, by asking what we do, grassroots, you know, self-definition. De do they think they are like this or do they think they are like that? We will see what, uh, what will happen, you know, what do they want, you know, what do the people want. So I uh, just want to inform you that this, this is a scientific activity, you know, which uh, we are putting to work in the service you know, of the peace process. We hope it will help because it leads to mutual understanding of what people are. And, and here I want to uh, point to you know, a problem of uh, you know, maybe a lack of interface <laughs> with, between what the grassroots say they want and what the leaders, you know, say, you know, uh, the people want on their behalf, all right? 
So this is, there's a very important mental issue here of whether the leadership of secessionist groups believe in democracy, in grassroots democracy, and whether if an opinion poll says that, that the people they represent want this, whether they're willing to accept it and, and say, uh, you know, no, we know better than you because you are not educated and we speak for you. All right? Right now, there is not that there is not that strong commitment to basic popular democracy, you know, which would lead, at least here in the Philippines, the Bangsa uh, uh, leadership to say, "Go ahead, we want, we would like to know what the Bangsa people feel." Right? As of now, it's more like an academic. Uh, oh, that's interesting, you know. But that doesn't necessarily affect what we will say. What we will do. So this is another problem in itself that I just point out to you. Dr. Hassan, I think uh, the gentleman over there first and then Dr. Hassan. Uh, this is an issue about the, the right to self-determination. Uh, take the case of the uh, Tamil Ila and the Sri Lanka. Uh, what has the civilized world uh, have, have done? Just watching when the Indians uh, with the Sri Lankan army and applied the military solution in wiping out virtually the resistance group. What has the civilized world have to do with this, this kind of uh, approach of the military solution? And they, they have rights also to exist of their own. They, they, they have their own uh, culture. Uh, and, Dr. Kasani, and then the lady of the back. I just want to uh, make a comment, and this is probably most useful to the undergraduates here. But I understand, of course, that uh, Dr. Mustafar's um, uh, lecture is focused on the Bangsamoro. I just want to underline the fact that the Bangsamoro are not the only indigenous people in Vietnam, but that there are the Lumans. So that this follows up the question also of who are the, who are the Bangsamoro. You know, you have non-Muslim indigenous peoples in Vietnam, and they have a different political problem than the problem of the Muslims. So I just want that underlined. That would be so I'm very focused focus on the global south. Uh, you, you talked about the impact of the ongoing uh, struggles for self-determination in ASEAN and the impact on uh, foreign relations uh, among the countries here. Uh, how about the role of the U.S.? Because we know that uh, it still has a very dominant influence politically, economically in the region. How does this influence uh, alter the dynamics of the self-determination struggles and what kind of arrangements will the U.S. favor? What kind of uh, resolutions to these struggles will the U.S. favor? Especially also in the context of what you said yesterday of the U.S. now we positioning itself as the Pacific power. Thank you. Ask the speaker to respond to the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very quickly, response to the four questions here about the government in Manila trying to do what the British and the Malayan governments did way back in the 50s and 60s in dealing with the communist insurgency. Here again, the situation is entirely different. The communist insurgency, one of their major grievances was related to citizenship. So what they did, both the British and the Malays, was to work out citizenship arrangements, and especially the Malay elite, they decided to accommodate the uh, Chinese community which supported the insurgents, or at least a portion of the Chinese community. And as a result of that, they cut the ground from under their feet. But here, I think you have a different situation. You're dealing with indigenous peoples who have grievances for whom the notion of identity is very strong. Unlike, say, the uh, communist insurgents in Malaya, they were perhaps attached to ideology, they may be attached to their ethnicity, in a certain sense, but it was quite different if you look at it in relation to what's been happening in the Philippines. Here you have a long-standing 
struggle, which has a lot to do with the land itself, with the land itself, which is why ancestral domains come in. The Chinese uh, communist layer, they were not struggling for land in that sense. It was, in fact, the only communist movement, it's very significant, the only communist movement in Southeast Asia that was totally non-indigenous to a big extent, compared to the movement in the Philippines, in Vietnam, these were indigenous movements. So I think one has to take that into account. Now, I think uh, Dr. Maha made a number of very interesting points. I'm in agreement with all this. I think that sort of scientific base is very important. Where you get the data right, you know, defining geography, defining identity, helping the peace process through efforts of this sort. And uh, what you said about going back to the people, finding out how, what the people really feel, I think that is also very, very critical. In fact, that is the point that has been made about what had happened in relation to the struggle for a Tamil Eden. This is the point that has also been made, which was the next question. Meaning by which, there are people who argue that a lot of the Tamils in Colombo a lot of the temples in other parts of uh, Sri Lanka, outside Jaffna, Jaffna, it was the north of the country, the temples in other parts of uh, Sri Lanka, they did not feel the same way about a temple even, about a temple land, as the temples of Jaffna, of the northern part. So, if there was a survey, if you really sought out their views and discovered what people really felt, maybe the response will be different. And this is something that not be attempted. And people had argued, in relation to the point that Dr. Ma had made, people had argued that the leadership of uh, the Tamil movement, the LTTE, the Tamil Tigers, as they were called, that they were actually very authoritarian. They're very, very authoritarian. They imposed their will upon their own people in the name of uh, secession, independence, fighting for their rights and so on. I put this forward as an example to you to show that there are complexities, even the struggles of people who are committed to self-determination, that it may be much more complex than we think. I personally would be very interested in knowing what the Bangsa Moro really feel, meaning by which the ordinary people, the masses, about secession, autonomy or the existing situation, I think their feelings would be very, very important. And if we are fighting for a democratic cause, if we say that we're doing this because we want to empower the people, then I think that the least one can do is to take into account their own voices and their own feelings. And uh, I agree with the point about the demands, I'm very much aware of that too. And uh, the last question, which is a very important question about the influence of the United States of America. I have heard that if you look at um, what's been happening in relation to the struggle with the Samoa, that some NGOs from the United States of America, NGOs which very often advance US foreign policy, but uh, it's camouflage. They perform as NGOs, but actually their real role is to advance U.S. interests. That these NGOs have been involved in the Bangsa Moro issue, that the Institute of Peace has been involved. We know what the Institute of Peace is. It's a very right-wing organization in the United States of America. They appear to be interested, I'm told, in the oil and gas that uh, may be there in the Bangsa Moro areas. That this may be one of the reasons why they are also very, very interested. So I think sometimes those of us who are fighting for freedom and democracy and so on, and I'm also here talking about what's happening in the Arab world, sometimes some of these elements are also used in the debate, which is very unfortunate. One has to be very, very careful about this. So I think in the case of uh, the struggle, the genuine struggle of ordinary people for a better future, whether it is uh, getting rid of an oppressive government or asserting one's identity, there may be other forces behind the scenes who are manipulating the situation for their own interests in pursuit of their own agenda.
and we must be ever vigilant. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Musafar. So this afternoon, we are very, we are really very happy to have an eminent scholar and activist to lecture on the issue of self-determination. While the speaker didn't really offer solutions to the problem, but he offered many insights you know, about the issue one, for instance, you know, when you uh, take the separatist uh, route, you know, create your own state, okay, uh, you have several challenges that need to face. One is uh, the, viability, the question of the viability of the state. And the other, of course, is about external sovereignty, which is about the recognition of the international community of your existence as a state. Okay, and the, the other one would be, uh, he rightly pointed out that at the regional level, okay, it will not be receive much support you know, if you take that route. Uh, I think also this is related to the uh, ASEAN you know, uh, principle of non-interference in the uh, domestic affairs of the state. Another, of course, uh, observation and insight that you can get from, that we got from this lecture is the uneasiness we could create, you know, again, okay, on the issue of uh, creating a separate state. Okay? Particularly uh, among our neighbors who, uh, who is experiencing the same problem. Okay, another, another idea presented, you know, or insight presented by Dr. Musafar, is that uh, self-determination can be seen you know, beyond the anti-colonial struggle, but we should also think about what does it mean in an era of globalization. And of course, uh, another one, okay, who is the boss tomorrow? Okay, so what do they want? And we just pointed out you know, by, um, um, well, this idea came from the audience, of course, from Dr. Mahar and also from Dr. Kasanthi. Okay, and Dr. Kasanthi says, you know, in Indonesia, uh, the boss tomorrow, Okay, it's not only the, the not the only IP, but you have others as well. Okay, who has a completely different problem with that of the bank tomorrow. And with that, let us give our speaker a round of applause. Actually, the issue of a right to self determination. So the forum was organized by again by the Third World Study Center, by the Department of Political Science, and the focus on global south. Okay, thank you very much.